Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the next talk. Yesterday, I already introduced a talk with a similar topic where the focus was on sustainability. And I already mentioned that it is a topic that is causing quite a lot of discussions. And for us at Sandstorm, we have been discussing this topic for a few years now. But in the last one and a half years, we started thinking about sustainability, not just from a carbon emissions point of view, but we also started to ask ourselves, what does sustainability mean for software development? And now I'm very happy that my colleague agreed to hold this talk here at NEOS conference. So please welcome on stage with me, Florian. So, hello. Uh, it's uh, really nice being on the big stage again. So the last time I announced the NEOS brand together with Robert, that it was a long, long time ago. So I'm really excited to talk about a, a, a topic that is really dear to us. Um, so, Tobias already introduced myself, so maybe you see these two guys up there, so that's me and my evil twin. Uh, thank you, Fabian, for being such a great uh, Photoshop wizard. Um, yeah, so at Sandstorm, we specialize in custom software development. Uh, we do a lot of consulting. We also create technical concepts, and we offer trainings, um, and we also create software for different indus industries, so we can look into different industries and um, yeah, profit from, from that. We also develop our own products. For example, we recently um, published a data protection compliant Google Maps alternative. Um, and we obviously love open source and we are strongly uh, rooted in the news community. And I was a little bit tired yesterday uh, because uh, normally I would be hitting the dance floor, and I'm sorry for not doing so. It feels uh, sacrilegious for me. Maybe next time I'm a little bit more into partying. Um, so why am I standing here today? So Tobias already mentioned in 2018, we asked ourselves uh, what the goal is that we want to achieve in 10 years. So we worked on a 10 years goal, and in 10 years, we want to be cracking uh, the hard nuts um, in projects that leave a positive I impact. So in other words, we, want, uh, we are looking for challenging projects that uh, leave a positive dent in the universe. And now what does this goal mean for our projects or for my daily life as a developer? And is it about writing clean code or is it about profiling? Is it about testing? Is it about reducing the far, uh, carbon footprint uh, of the applications we ship? And what does sustainability actually mean to us? And to answer these questions, uh, we looked at the sustainable development goals. Who of you knows these? OK, so they, they have been published by the UN, and they are political goals um, to ensure a sustainable economic, social, and ecological development over the next year, so that we can still keep our planet, <laughs> yeah, and be uh, work with our resources we have. Um, uh, but what does these actually have to do with software development? And there is a really interesting analysis on how new technologies and materials and IT can support these goals I just showed you. Um, and you see some examples here. On the left side, you see uh, the SDGs with the highest number of uh, present-day fourth industrial evolution applications. And on the right side, you see the SD 
sustainable development goals uh, with the lowest number. And at the bottom, you have some examples on what for the fourth industrial uh, revolution is all about. So it's about big data platforms, AI, blockchain, and it's all centered around technology and it's also around, centered around software solutions. So as an agency developing software, we ask ourselves what makes our software sustainable. And one important question or the most important question for me is always what is the purpose of our software? So what added value do we generate? Uh, what added value does, do we generate for society? Um, and I brought some examples of uh, some example projects. Um, for example, this is a Zündstoffe platform. It, uh, platform. it allows organizations uh, to donate material that would otherwise be disposed. So the material can then later be picked up by theaters, daycares, artists for free, and then the material is not thrown away. And um, a, a pretty nice example to illustrate this is, uh, for example, you have a company that is producing tape, and they change their product line, so the first tapes that come off that line, they will be cut in the wrong dimension, so they will be too narrow until the machines are dialed in, and in the, in the past, or in general, in industry, these things will be thrown away because they don't meet um, quality standards. And that's a crazy thing, because I personally do not care if I use a tape that's one millimeter, millimeter too, too small. But that's the reality right now. And I think that as a developer, we, we can, like, support organizations, and in this case, it's um, uh, fine, an association, um, uh, and, and, and help them with these kinds of solution, uh, solutions. Um, and this uh, software also helps to strengthen uh, the local circular economy. Tech stack here is Symfony uh, with API platform and a React client and the GraphQL uh, API. So for me, that was also a really interesting project because I had the first, first uh, I had to first use API platform. Uh, I used API platform for the first time, and you can really quickly create these kinds of uh, platforms. Um, another example from the Neos world. This is a homepage builder based on Neos for organic farms with a shop integration. And we currently have 59 NEOS instances running that can be theme customized and that are automatically provisioned. And this is a big strength of NEOS. So if you have like an industry uh, um, where you also have the domain knowledge, it, it can be a good idea to provide such a, such a product. Um, and the last example is an app development. Uh, this is the SolarWatt Home app, and it allows you to manage energy production and consumption of your house, and also for all installed photovoltaic modules. And if you have a heat pump, you can also uh, see all the values in, in the app. Um, the tech stack is uh, right now is Flutter, and we also implemented the Go proxy. Uh, the funny thing is that we also implemented the app before that app, and it was written in React Native. and um, it's a, a, a really big difference between the old and the new app because with Flutter we can utilize hardware more efficiently and it's faster and yeah. Also a nice project, so I'm currently on that project. It's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, these were examples of projects that directly contribute to the SDGs, but there might be projects that do not look sustainable at the first glance. Uh, Let's make a quick example here. Let's say I want to manage my fleet. Then I could say I want to measure my carbon footprint, and there are al already standard solutions out there that do it. And why would I want to measure my carbon footprint? Well, maybe to compensate for the use of the cars. But I could also say that, click on, yeah, okay, that I want to reduce my carbon footprint maybe by proposing uh, not, not giving out a car, but maybe giving out a connection via public transportation. And then I can slowly but surely reduce the number of cars in my fleet. So I think for me personally, it's also about challenging requirements if, you're, if, if we are starting a project. 
and especially also trying to consider all as aspects of sustainability, not only thinking about the carbon footprint, but maybe also thinking about the sustainable development goals I showed you earlier. <coughs> um, there's another nice example from our daily work. So we, for us, we identified accessibility as a topic to, uh, to start challenging requirements if we start a new project. And that means that we start calculating all of our offers with non-optional ex uh, non accessibility optimizations. And additionally to that, we also offer uh, like a package where, it's where there's more optimization. And this is a great way to start a discussion uh, with the customer about accessibility. Um, because at some point we have to talk about this. It's in the paper and the customer will eventually, uh, eventually ask what, what, what this is and we have to explain. Um, yes, so that is something we are experimenting right now with. Um, so if we're talking about software and we also talk about digital transformation and uh, software solutions are always a great way to support the digital transformation uh, and maybe actually improve, uh, actually improve something. But in the end, you might end up with, a, uh, uh, with no improvement at all because you just copied a bad analog process and just made it digital. So it's not only about writing a software, it's also about changing the process around it. And in the best case, you might end up with a solution that does not require any digital solution at all. But if we're talking about actually programming something or uh, yeah, transferring the requirements into code, um, we also should talk about demand-driven solutions. So um, we should focus on functionality that is actually used and, and solves the real problem. And for that topic, scope creep is like your biggest enemy um, <laughs> because uh, the, you, you will have a function creep. So more functionality will uh, eventually make it into the, into the software, and this will eventually also um, involve more infrastructure. And in, in the end, uh, the footprint will be, will be worse. Um, on, the, on the pro side, you have a le less complex software. It's more stable, easier to maintain. You can ship features faster. You all know that. Um, and it's also more fun to develop, and that's also a really important uh, part for us when talking about sustainability in software development. Me as a de I, as a developer, want, want to have some kind of fun when creating digital solutions. And it's also economically more sustainable because uh, it costs less and it's easier to, to add new features. Um, and when we try, when we talk about demand-driven solutions, we should be able to, to integrate the knowledge we gain during a process, and we should also be able to deviate from the original goal because we learn something while doing a project, and and that also requires a project management methodology that allows for that. And I guess you all use some kind of lean, agile project management mythology in your projects. So that's also, sustainability can be an argument for, for uh, agile software development too. Um, so that, once we have our requirements straight, then we don't start implementing yet because we often need some kind of design. And for me in the past, sustainable design was primarily tied to physical objects, for, to products, and maybe to industrial design. But uh, it can also be applied to screen design, and I try to give some examples here. And this is a really extreme one. Uh, there is like the concept of low impact design, and this is it's not a project by us, but it's <laughs> a rather extreme example. So on the left side, you have a version of the shop where they do not provide any pictures of products. They only provide vector images. And in the end, you do not have to do any optimization of images at all because this is going to have the smallest foot footprint possible. And they also let the user choose if they want, to, uh, if they want the left, uh, the, 
the low impact version or the lesser, uh, the, the, the other version with the images. Um, yes. When thinking about low impact design, you should also avoid uh, using video embeds and you can also try uh, using system font stacks rather than relying on web fonts and that's always something where you have to talk to the customer if they really need their, I don't know, the web font or if they are fine by using Helvetica maybe, I don't know. But that's also something you can, you can challenge. And this is maybe an example, this is a project of us. Uh, if you need real images, uh, their general style can have an impact on how well they can be optimized. So that's again a question of design. Uh, you can consider using less detailed pictures, especially above the fold, because they can be optimized more easily. And if you do not have an optimized design, there are still a couple of things you can do. You can use modern image formats like WebP, image variants, you can lazy load images. and there are packages for that for NEOS, for example, Sideguys Kaleidoscope, who helps you with that. And topping it off, you can also provide a low impact version of your web page and let the user choose what kind of version they want to, to use. And we have been experimenting a little bit on the last retreat. So if you have questions, uh, you can ask Leonard. He brought up that idea. He's sitting back there and taking care of the live streaming. Um, so what you see is we are using video embeds. We are using detailed images. And we still wanted the user to decide if they want to see all that. So we have an eco mode, which switches off all, all embeds, all images. And then the user can decide what image he wants to see or he or she wants to see. Um, it's also very important that the editor provides meaningful alt text for, the, for this to work. And now you can start navigating the page and you will stay in this mode. Um, and after hearing the talk of, talk of Max, it would be also nice to maybe show how, how many carbon is maybe reduced by using this eco mode so the user can decide. Yes. Okay, that was an, like a real-world example. So let's talk about sustainable design and talk about accessibility. Um, accessibility is the practice of making information, activities uh, uh, more usable uh, for as many people as possible. And I brought another example. This is uh, a learning platform for the TU Dortmund we implemented, and it's a digital learning platform developed to provide prospective teachers uh, with uh, practical experiences and opportunities for self-reflection uh, using video-based case studies and specific subject-related didactic questions. So we basically implemented video editing and editing in the browser. So what happens is uh, the students get a, a video and uh, and then they get exercises and they have to cut the video and rearrange it to create a more didactic, valuable, more valuable situation. Uh, they also can annotate videos and, uh, yeah. And uh, the TU Dortmund is also a public client, so they, they have, so accessibility is required. Um, and with video editing, this can get really, 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 really complex. Um, and we also made some mistakes, but uh, this is also a great way to learn. So um, the biggest learnings are, uh, is that accessibility must be part of the UI and UX design process. Um, and that, that is not something that you can easily add later in this kind of uh, in this kind of project because you, you, will be, you will end up with different kind of navigation patterns if you are optimizing, for example, for keyboard uh, usage. So everything has to be reachable with the keyboard. Information has to be structured differently um, uh, so that somebody with a screen reader can navigate with ease. Um, another important learning is that uh, so we, we we got direct feedback from people that actually use assessive technologies um, on a daily basis, and this is, was really valuable because I can, 
there's a Ah, yeah, okay. Because I can read all these guidelines and do my best trying to implement them. Um, and I've also, I, 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 I also used a screen reader in the past. Uh, but for me, it's really hard to pinpoint what the highest priority uh, should be here in real life. So we really need, what we really need is feedback of people and developers that are directly affected and therefore know what they are talking about. Um, yeah. Okay, but we can still do a lot of things to improve that. So we as an agency have some kind of Neos Kickstarter projects because we do not start from scratch for each project. So what we did is in the last weeks, we optimized our components for keyboard navigation. And these features will be just available in future projects. And future projects will benefit from that. And the next thing now would be to get somebody to audit this who, who is actually who actually knows what he's talking about, so that would be great if we could do that as a next step. So I touched on some topics. I said that I wanted to concentrate on the things that go beyond the carbon footprint, but I also got into coding a little bit. So let's talk about a little bit more about coding. Um, we have some best practices uh, that I don't want to, I can read them out, but uh, we have documented them in a, in, a, in a Git repository, so you can also read there and contribute, and I want to pick out some, um, some topics uh, to br briefly talk about, because I think they're pretty interesting, at least to me. So, for example, we can look at programming languages in general, and there are some studies that show, for example, energy consumption of some programming languages, and we have PHP here, and Go, and then we have C. Um, and what we see is that Go uses three times the energy, uh, and PHP like 30 times the energy. Um, and interesting enough, the newest documentation suggests, for example, to use Redis for caching for bigger instances of Neos. Redis is written, is written in, in C, for example, uh, to be more efficient with its resources. And uh, the same can also be applied to, to our own code or the our own solutions we create. Um, oh, so it's so right going. OK. As an example, we had uh, we created a, a mailer once uh, using Neos, so you could create your newsletter in Neos, and we wanted to be able to send out thousands of emails in a really short amount of time. And we did not use PHP for that. We used a little Go application that does it for us because it's more efficient with, with, this, with this kind of work. And while speaking about uh, emails, uh, I recently got an email. Uh, I, I'm in the van life uh, community, and I ordered like a little toilet, a composting toilet from a new and hip company, and they asked me after like one month if I still wanted to receive the newsletter, and they had a button in there, so if you don't press that button, we won't send you any emails anymore, and I think that's a really sustainable way of preventing useless emails from being sent, because uh, right now we always I always try to. I always have to click if I don't want uh, the newsletter anymore. So I, I think that's an interesting, uh, also an interesting uh, thing, on how to to reduce like the infrastructure being used to send out emails. Okay. So performance is great, um, but even badly written code can result in a performant application because uh, we have the power of scalability, and we can mitigate bad performance by upscaling either vertically or horizontally. Um, and Max already also illustrated that in his talk yesterday. So we have to keep scalability in mind when designing applications, but I, I think the first, the first uh, goal should be to not having to scale at all. Um, and this always depends on your architecture, on the language you use, on your frameworks, on the libraries, and on your own code. 
Um, and I have, an, again, an example. We, we use GitLab, and sure, we also use pipelines to build our projects. And we have grown as a company and have more projects. And so we decided to activate auto-scaling in GitLab to be able to have the pipelines run through faster. But we sh could have also looked into the actual configuration of the pipeline. And last week, I took a look at the one project I showed you. And there are some config options that prevent unnecessary runs of pipelines. So there is an interruptible flag. flag so if you push new commits, an old pipeline will be stopped. So that was all fine, was configured the right way. But what I did not configure in the pipeline was that um, tests were running uh, even if the code did not change that they test. So we have front-end tests and server tests, and you can also do that in your pipeline. And if you, yeah, so you should maybe, or we should maybe think about uh, also looking and in other projects, if the pipeline are con configured correctly, and if then we need auto-scaling, sure, then, then we probably need auto-scaling. Um, OK, and the last uh, topic that is, for me, interesting is the, the circle of build, measure, learn, because uh, if we try to improve something, uh, for example, trying to reduce the carbon footprint, we should also try to measure that. Um, and it's currently it's pretty hard, or maybe not, <laughs> to measure, the, uh, measure the energy directly. It's easier to just uh, maybe profile your application. And I, in the past, I tended to profiling. I only used profiling if the application felt, felt slow. But maybe we, sh uh, we should. Or I should start profiling if the application feels, feels fast, because uh, it can be even faster uh, or more and more efficient. And we are also experimenting with different kind of uh, measuring techniques. So we have started a software qual quality dashboard where we aggregate KPIs for um, uh, static code analysis. And we are also uh, trying to get the Lighthouse scores and we're trying that on a, we want to do that on a regular basis. So this is also on the to-do list. We uh, want to integrate Pelly into that to have automated accessibility testing. Um, yeah, and ultimately, I personally want to have pipelines fail if we have regressions and if the scores go down, so we are forced, uh, so we force ourselves to fix, fix that. Now, these were some more technical aspects about uh, sustainable software de development, and I want to sum up a little bit here. Um, so the last five years have been quite a journey for me, starting uh, with sustainability feels more like a buzzword that everybody puts on their products, to sustainability in software development is all about reducing your carbon footprint. And today, I was giving you a totally different talk on that subject. Um, so there's much more to sustainable software development than just the footprint. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm still missing a lot of aspects uh, here. But that's OK, uh, because I'm still learning. And I have to start somewhere. And I should also focus, or we should focus, on, on, on things. Uh, that are important to us and take the first step. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. If you do have further questions, send them along. What I can already see here, what I think is really nice, that we're starting to share these kind of information with each other. So here's one. Um, it's not a question. It's a information. So someone shared a link with us. They said it's worth looking at solar.lowtechmagazine.com slash about you. I don't have any further information what that is about. So I'll check it out. Probably yes. in the context of your presentation, I, I think so. something to look at. 
another information from the audience. There is an accessibility tester linter called X DevTools that can be integrated into CI and provides first hints for accessibility testing. Yeah. So integrating that as part of our development process, as you showed us with the CI tools that we integrated at Sandstorm. Share those information. Yeah, we as developers, we can really make a difference here. So thank you very much for sharing. A question that we got, that is for you, is do you actively look for sustainable projects or do people ask you to do them or do we start them ourselves? Mm. I would say that is an uh, yeah, interesting question. I would say all, because uh, once we started creating the 10 years goal, we also started networking into that direction. We went to talks. Uh, we also support other projects with a reduced hourly rate, for example. And we also apply for Ausschreibungen. I don't have the word right now. But we also look for these kinds of projects uh, and and it's a co coherent picture, uh, picture, so a new customer, they, they see that we kind of are into that topic and it's not just uh, greenwashing and then they tend to choose us maybe over somebody else. All right, thank you. And here's also a fun one. As we are halfway to 2028, to our 10-year goal, what was the best achievement so far for you? So for me, I'm, I mean, I, I'm also co-founder, so I always worried about uh, will it be economically sustainable? And we are half time right now and 50% uh, of our revenue comes from these kind of purpose projects that I showed you. Um, I, I did not believe that we will be there that fast, so that, that is something that for me is, so I, I don't have sleepless nights because we kind of have some transformation going on and uh, on at, at Sandstorm. And here's a fun one. What happens after 2028? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll sit together again for four days and, 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 and uh, think about what, what, what the next big thing will be for us. So, yeah, nothing is... Nichts ist so beständig wie die Veränderung. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you know what I mean. All right. <laughs> Florian, thank you very, very much for sharing these insights with us. If you have any further questions. <laughs>